Awesome. Thanks, Nina. Um, morning, everyone. I'm Cooper Kersey. I'm one of the R3s in the program. And today um, I'll be talking about heart failure management for the unstably housed patient. Um, and when I was thinking about putting together this talk, I couldn't couldn't decide between talking about HEF-PEF or HEF-REF or HEF-MREF or any of the other types of heart failure. Um, and I, I realized that there's, there's really good guide that the sort of the beauty of cardiology is there's really good guidelines for all of these common disease pathways and and this topic in particular of um, how to balance patients heart failure management and their their um, housing situation or lack of housing is something that I found to be a lot more tricky and um, and something I've really struggled with so The, I hope you all enjoy it and find it um, useful and applicable to your clinical practice. Cool, so um, no financial disclosures. I, I put this up here that I'm not a cardiologist or a homeless health expert, not to state the obvious, but to acknowledge that there, um, there's a wealth of knowledge in this Zoom room. And um, I, I think I spend a lot of time thinking about this topic and I've, I've tried my best to make this an evidence-based uh, talk, um, but there's definitely no right way to do this. And so I, I welcome um, if, if the folks have had um, like techniques or things that have worked for them in the path, uh, in the past when um, managing heart failure in, in homeless patients, um, definitely chime in or, or throw your ideas into the chat. I'd, I'd love to hear them. Um, so before we get started, just to sort of pull the, pull the room and see where everyone's at experience-wise, a um, quick poll, just yes, no, if you have discharged a patient from the hospital after a heart failure exacerbation um, who was unstably housed. Cool. Okay. So almost everyone has uh, done this. So it seems like it's something that we as residents come across a lot in our, um, in our uh, uh, daily lives. Um, and then follow-up question, um, if yes, um, did this discharge process make, um, or, or did this make the discharge process more challenging um, or introduce some uncertainty into your discharge plan? Um, the, the patient's uh, un unstable housing, that is. Well, wow, okay, 100%. Um, that was sort of a softball question. Um, but uh, so, yeah, it seems like uh, definitely um, a pertinent, pertinent topic, and I hope that I can sort of ease some of that uncertainty and um, show you a little bit of a roadmap for how to um, how to make the discharge plan a little a little safer. Um, so that segues into my learning objectives for the talk. Um, my hope is that at the end of the talk, we will all understand the impact of housing or lack of housing on heart failure outcomes. Um, I'm going to propose uh, what I think is a gold standard for discharging any patient uh, with heart failure from the hospital. And then um, we'll adapt. We'll sort of look into the evidence um, for some of the some of the challenges and, and barriers that patients who are homeless face in their heart failure self management, and and adapt that gold standard to fit a person who's homeless. Um, and then leave you with a few like tangible tools um, that you can take with you onto the wards. Um, and I am going to focus mainly on the discharge process because I think that's a a common um, transition of care where there are errors and um, it's a, definitely a time of uncertainty for patients and, and for us as providers. Um, so um, how does housing impact heart failure? Um, so first, just to define homelessness, this, this is the legal definition, which I like because it, it allows for a, a decent amount of um, flexibility in the like the lived experience of, of someone who is is homeless um, in that it's it's fairly vague. Um, so the definition is any any individual or 
family who lacks a fixed regular nighttime shelter. Um, and, and that can be people who are staying in emergency shelters. So here in Seattle, that would be um, somewhere like the Union Gospel Mission um, down in Pioneer Square or uh, Mary's Place, which is a shelter for uh, mainly women and children. Um, it, it includes um, people living in transitional housing. So this is sort of short-term housing like the Aloha Inn here in Seattle where I've had some patients stay um, for a few months while they're, they're getting more permanent housing. And then uh, the last category is unsheltered. Um, and that can also look like a variety of things, you know, staying in um, tents, uh, in vans, any, anywhere um, where someone can sort of get out of the elements and, and get some shelter. Um, and the, the next few slides have data from the, um, the National Alliance to End Homelessness, and it's all based on um, the point in time counts, which if you hadn't heard, haven't heard of them is uh, like a couple times a year um, in, in every city, um, volunteers go out and basically count every, um, everyone who is living with homelessness, either in uh, shelter beds or unsheltered and come up with these uh, statistics on the sort of the current state of homelessness. Um, and you can see here that uh, the last like 14 years, there actually has been a 10% decrease in homelessness in the US. Um, but that more recently, the last like five years, um, it's, it's on the rise again. Um, and a couple important groups, like subgroups in here to point out are that um, this uh, this red line is unsheltered people, um, and and that has the, the percentage, and so that's um, that's that last group of the in, from, of the prior slide. So people who aren't in emergency shelters or transitional housing, and and people who are unsheltered uh, has increased thirty percent in the last five years. And then the the sort of light green light green line here is chronically homeless individuals. And so those are folks who have been homeless for over a year or um, multiple times in the last three years. And, and um, uh, those numbers are also, also on the rise. And then if we zoom in a little bit more on Washington um, in King County, Washington has the highest, or sorry, the fourth highest um, rates of homelessness in the, in the country. Um, at, uh, I think it's roughly, it's 30, um, 30 people in 100,000 are, are, are homeless. And then King County has the uh, 19th, uh, the 19th highest um, rate of homelessness of any county at uh, about 50 per 100,000. So it's definitely a, a problem uh, locally. Um, and then how does homelessness impact health? Um, this, this data is a little, it's a little dated. Um, it's, for, it's from a survey study in 2009, um, but uh, you can see here that all these chronic conditions are about twice to three times um, more prevalent in um, homeless individuals than uh, people who are, are housed. Um, and I sort of cherry picked these five because they're all risk factors for cardiovascular disease or, or create um, challenges with managing cardiovascular disease. So hypertension and diabetes can cause um, HEF-PEF, they're atherosclerotic risk factors. Um, uh, MIs can cause HEF-REF and ischemic cardiomyopathy. And then with substance use, depending on the substance, if it's alcohol or um, stimulants, uh, the, um, th those are common causes of toxin-mediated cardiomyopathy. Um, and then, Moving on to uh, cardiovascular di disease in particular. So it, it, from the prior slide, it, it seems like pe uh, people who are homeless are more, uh, have a higher prevalence of MI. Um, and then sort of what happens when they show up to the hospital complaining of chest pain. Um, this, this study was, uh, they, I think it was a retrospective study of over 2000 hospitalizations, or sorry, 2 million hospitalizations over in three different states over five years um, and looked at the like diagnosis codes for NSTEMI and STEMI um, and broke, broke the patients up into two groups of um, homeless or non-homeless. And um, you can see in the A panel, this is, this is the NSTEMI diagnosis that 
um, uh, homeless patients were about 20% uh, less likely to undergo diagnostic coronary angi angiography. And then similarly about 20% um, less likely to undergo PCI and much less likely to get a cabbage. And you could argue that like NSTEMI is kind of a nebulous diagnosis. And if it was a demand uh, ischemia, maybe, maybe these um, diagnostic tests or procedures weren't even indicated, but then the, the data holds true in, in STEMI diagnoses, which are very clear electrocardiographic diagnosis, diagnoses and have a very clear um, treatment algorithm that um, sort of mandates uh, um, angiography and, and PCI within 90 minutes. Um, and so, yeah, even in the STEMI group, um, you see there's a, a st statistically significant difference in the uh, likelihood of undergoing um, coronary angiography, PCI, and cabbage. Um, so if, you know, this is sort of setting, setting up patients who are homeless to, to go on to develop heart failure if they're, if they're suffering um, myocardial infarctions and not undergoing guideline-directed um, treatment and therapy, they're, they're going to be at higher risk of uh, developing an ischemic cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Um, and then, uh, so heart failure in, in particular, again, it's more prevalent from that same survey study, more prevalent in the um, homeless population. And when patients who are homeless are hospitalized with heart failure, um, they have an increased risk of uh, mortality during that hospitalization. Um, and then I think an important point, and, and one, um, especially since I'll be focusing on transitions of care and the discharge process, is that homeless patients are uh, less likely to make it to a transition of care um, visit after a hospitalization for heart failure. And I think those, like that first clinic visit after um, your index hospitalization for heart failure is, is one of the most important um, visits uh, that a patient will have. And that's where diuretics are adjusted and um, guideline-directed medical therapy is up titrated. And um, yeah, so that's sort of my, my hope is we can uh, bridge that uh, transition of care a little better. Um, wanted to pause there before moving on to see if um, folks have any questions or, or thoughts. Cooper, I don't know if you can see them, but there's a couple comments in the chat. Um, uh, I can read them. Oh yeah, um, chicken or egg. Good question, Dr. Cho. Um, history of MI is interesting to me, given that I expect. Yeah, that uh, it's a good point, Jordan. That um, these are like confirmed diagnoses of of MI from that survey study, and and there's you, you're sort of bringing up whether um, patients who are homeless are less likely to. Um, less likely to seek care um, and then would have a higher percentage of like undiagnosed or missed MI. Easy to imagine folks assuming. Yeah, James, I think that was like sort of what I was reading into this data was that I, I've, yeah, I've like listened in on CATH conferences where um, uh, a bunch of interventionalists and surgeons are like debating whether or not a patient would be able to take DAPT and have not actually asked a patient that patient whether if they would be uh, able to take two medications um, daily. And I think that, yeah, that could be a major reason for why uh, there is that discrepancy. And um, obviously, uh, yeah, I think something I'll touch on later um, is, yeah, that sort of, uh, I, I, I think patients who are homeless, uh, there's a, a wide spectrum of ability to self-manage disease and sort of meeting them where they are and, and seeing what, what they feel capable of doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what they feel up for is, is a, a better uh, starting point than just um, saying, oh, well, this, this person doesn't have housing, so thus they cannot take X medication. And then Paul, I uh, sense of how much of these disparities are unique to cardiovascular disease. Um, 
Yeah, uh, Paul, I think, uh, I don't think it's from, from my lit review, um, since I did cherry pick the, the cardiovascular risk factors and cardiovascular diseases, it, it was not unique to cardiovascular disease. It's more um, general disparities in, in um, health and, and access to health care. Um, yeah, cool. Great questions. Um, cool. So I'm going to just in the interest of time, move on. Um, so now we're going to back up and just sort of think of heart failure patient in general. Um, and so this, uh, didn't set up a poll. So if, if you, and it's more like free response, so just type, type things in the chat or feel free to unmute and, um, chime in. Imagine you're on, uh, cards a, and you're discharging a 67 year old woman who was just admitted with new decompensated heart failure. Um, she underwent uh, a cath, which showed no coronary disease um, and all of her lab testings are pretty normal. So at this part, point she has sort of um, idiopathic cardiomyopathy. Um, you've, you've started her on all the right meds um, and you're getting ready to discharge her. And so what, what would you include? What are some like high points you would hit on your uh, discharge teaching for this patient? Come to clinic, yes, love it. Clinic is where people get better, not the hospital. Um, anything else, any ch like lifestyle changes? Love it, Rashid says daily weights, monitor blood pressure, low sodium diet, talking about meds, fluid restriction. Great. I think these are, those are all the, um, all the main care or main categories of, uh, discharge teaching that I think of. Um, thanks everyone for participating. Um, so yeah, the four, I think the four important things to touch on when you're discharging a patient with new, especially with new heart failure is the goal is for the, for the patient to understand what the disease is. So what is heart failure? Um, what is the point of all the medications? Um, I think we put patients on a ton of meds and it doesn't always, uh, I, I think it doesn't always make sense why um, uh, one disease requires all these medications. Um, and I think it's important to break up sort of the point of the guideline directed medical therapy and then the point of the diuretic. Um, and then what I called sort of heart failure self-care or how people can change what they do in their day-to-day -day life um, for their heart. And then making sure, as Andrew said, that their follow-up is really clear and that they have uh, uh, clear return precautions. So what is heart failure? Um, I put this, <laughs> included this definition kind of as a joke and then crossed it out. But it was kind of crazy. Last year, they uh, got together like all the, the most, uh, claimed heart failure experts in the in the world from Japan and Europe and the US and it's like this long there's like 30 authors of the of the best heart failure people in the world um, to come up with this like one sentence definition and it's very like it's simultaneously like too vague calling it like symptom a syndrome with symptoms and signs but also a little too specific mentioning like natriuretic peptide levels so i don't think that's how we should define heart failure for our patients um, I came up with this definition. It's not perfect. Um, I'd love to hear if other, if other people have, I think heart failure is hard to define for patients. So if people have other ways that they describe it, I'd love to hear that. I, so I said that uh, heart failure is a chronic progressive condition caused by damage to the heart muscle leading to an inability to pump enough blood uh, to the body to supply it with oxygen. I think the important things that this touches on is that it's chronic and progressive and that that um, is sort of a jumping off point to your explanation of the medications, um, because if I think it's important to understand that it's a progressive disease and that that's why we put patients on so many medications. Um, so this uh, this slide is specifically for HEFREF. The rest of the talk is sort of heart failure in general. Um, 
And so the, uh, yeah, the, the new heart failure guidelines from about a year ago do recommend Entresto or an ARNI, uh, um, so Sucubitril Valsartan over ACEs and ARBs for your RAST inhibition. Um, and then uh, beta blockers, MRAs and SGLT2 inhibitors were the other new addition to, to those guidelines. So people are calling it quad therapy now and there's more and more evidence that um, uh, sort of the sooner you can get people on all four classes of meds and titrate their doses up, the, the better their outcomes are. So um, uh, I, would, I, think, I think it's important to include in the discharge teaching, I don't think you need to go into like the mechanism of action of each med, but I think it's important to mention that these four meds, their point is to um, slow that progression of the uh, damage to the heart and in, in some cases reverse it and that they actually um, increase, uh, you know, increase life, lifespan in, in patients with uh, heart failure. And then just as an example, uh, to show like what a patient would actually be doing day to day on these meds, um, they included uh, like a little medi set. So since Entresto is BID and some cardiologists like to dose metoprolol BID, um, this is what, uh, this is what their daily meds over on the right would look like if, if they're on um, this medication regimen. Um, cool, so next up is the like lifestyle modifications. Um, and I, yeah, just, I wasn't actually sure what the guidelines recommended for this. So I, I looked at the like discharge heart failure guidelines um, and yeah, they, they do recommend a low sodium diet and, and specifically less than two grams if patients are still volume overloaded and two to three grams if they are more euvolemic. Um, it, yeah, it is recommended that patients take their, their weight daily and take it in the morning before eating or taking their diuretics. Um, interestingly, this was new to me or news to me that there is no evidence for fluid restriction when patients are not acutely decompensated or, or as long as they're not hyponatremic. Um, I think, I think you can tell patients that if they, if they take in more water, they might, they might need more of their diuretic, but there isn't, uh, you don't need to like discharge people from the hospital on a two liter fluid restriction and then diuretics the yeah, just explaining how they work and doubling the dose if, if, um, if they're not responding. Um, and then for the last bit, which is the follow-up and return precautions. So the, the heart failure guidelines do say that patients should be seen in clinic within seven days of discharge for a heart failure exacerbation, which is almost impossible um, to schedule in our, our clinics, um, but that is the, the gold standard. Um, and then for how, how to monitor their weights, um, they should call clinic if they gain two pounds in a day or five pounds in a week. Um, and then sort of more severe return precautions for the emergency department. Um, cool. So that, uh, those are the, that's sort of like the, what I think of as the gold standard um, uh, for discharging someone with heart failure. Moving on to, um, Oh, I guess I'm just gonna open up the chat. Oh yeah, good question, Rashid. Cards, uh, cards or PCP? Um, it, it said a clinic um, in the guidelines. So I think um, either cards or PCP, I think the main things you want are like um, a wait uh, a week after the hospital um, and uh, to check a set of labs to make sure they're tolerating all the meds okay. Cool. Okay, so now um, how do we adapt that gold standard for a patient who um, is homeless? And so I want you to go back, go back to that patient on cards A that you're discharging, um, but imagine that instead of that, uh, she tells you that she stays in, in her van and she's um, done that for years and that's where she feels most comfortable and um, sort of has no, doesn't currently have an interest in pursuing um, long-term housing. <clears throat> and so how are you uh, as the resident discharging her going to uh, modify your, your discharge education um, for, the, for her um, housing situation?
yeah, it's tough. Um, love it. Um, Emily is mentioning the timing of diuretics, access to restroom and diuretics. Um, and Zainab previously mentioned for the last um, point of whether um, a homeless patient would be able to do daily weights, so access to scales, things like that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and um, so for this last section, I um, tried to look into, there really is no like quantitative evidence for how we should be doing this, but there was a cool study done in New Haven um, where it was like a couple of MDs and an MPH and a, like a peer advocate for um, people living with homelessness uh, interviewed 19, um, 19 patients who were homeless and had heart failure over the course of a year and uh, did sort of a qualitative research study. Um, and they like analyzed the, the interviews and, and extracted themes and quotes. Um, and the three themes um, that sort of rang through for, for challenges that they faced were that um, the instability of being homeless um, impedes uh, heart failure self-management. And uh, secondly, that homelessness creates trade-off between trade-offs between basic necessities and heart failure management. And then finally, that unfortunately, um, stigmatization by healthcare providers really influence the experiences of, of homeless individuals. Um, and so I think these, these are sort of three areas we can focus on where, how we can adapt that, that gold standard to, um, to a patient who is homeless. Um, and the quotes from the study were actually pretty powerful. And so this um, I included them and wanted to read them because I think um, my overarching uh, message for, for how to do discharge teaching in this scenario is that it should be um, patient-centered and individualized to, the, um, to that, that individual's like, living, uh, living situation and, and what they feel capable of and have access to. Um, and so this, this quote, uh, exemplifies the instability of, um, of, uh, being homeless. And so it's, uh, I was in a room with 12 people. I didn't have a scale because you had to carry the scale every night to your bed and you had to carry everything every morning back to the closet to lock it up for the day. So that, so that could be difficult because when I got out of the hospital, I was really weak. Um, so it seems like this person is in some sort of like emergency shelter, uh, um, sharing a room with 12 people. And there is actually a scale on the premises, but um, they are uh, sort of 2D conditioned from the hospital stay to actually uh, use it day to day. Um, secondly, for trade-offs, um, uh, when you get homeless, you have to think, um, where can I close my eyes? Um, because I messed around and didn't get to the shelter in time. Um, I got to go sit in one of the bus stop things and try to get me some sleep or kick back, get out of the rain or snow. Heart failure is the last thing on your mind until you end up, the ambulance is picking you up, taking you to the hospital. That's when, wow, I should have been taking care of myself. Um, so this quote really exemplifies the, um, the, uh, the trade-off that, you know, the explaining the like long-term mortality benefit of a medication is going to be a lot less, uh, there's a you know short-term uh, need to find shelter or food, and the the trade-off of taking the bus to the pharmacy to pick up the meds might be missing a shelter bed for the evening. Um, and then finally, stigma. This quote is uh, sort of hard to read, um, but uh, so in the in the emergency room, they have no heart. When you're homeless. They look down on you, the doctors, the nurses, the techs, the staff, period. The social workers were telling me this is not a hotel. Don't think you're going to live here. I'm in heart failure. I'm half dead. And all you're worried about is saying this isn't a hotel. How dare you belittle me like that? None of my providers cared. What did they do? Nothing but treat me and send me back to the street. Um, so I think we're all, uh, as residents in this program, fortunate enough to work at Harborview and, um, and experience the like the mission driven care of Harborview that is sort of the exact opposite of this. Um, and uh, but I think it's important to know that 
patients do face this um, when they interact with the healthcare system and that um, that, that likely impacts their uh, willingness and um, comfort with uh, seeking care. And then the flip side of this stigma um, was one quote where um, a patient's cardiologist like clearly advocated for them. Um, and so I'll read this one to end on a brighter note. Uh, my cardiologist went to help me obtain assistance through social services and said, he has a, a serious heart issue. And the fact that he is homeless has created an enormous amount of stress. My cardiologist was the only one that said, yes, he does need help. Once she filled out proper paperwork or went through channels, I got a place to live. I felt like I was talking to a person and the doctor when I talked to her. Some of the other doctors, I felt like I was talking to a used car salesman. My cardiologist put her foot in the ring and it triggered a response out of me that, okay, she really does care. Um, so yeah, just uh, sort of clear evidence that um, advocating for um, our patients really does go a long way and that, um, yeah, that if, if we go the extra mile for them, it, it can really do a lot in terms of uh, creating buy-in. Um, so um, keep having these three sort of barriers in mind of uh, um, the trade-offs and instability and stigma, how can we uh, bridge the gap when discharging patients? Um, and the, the study actually um, identified four four ways um, that we can do that. Um, first, it, it mentioned that our anticipatory guidance or our discharge education should be aimed at the unique challenges faced by that individual. Um, secondly, it mentioned um, uh, simplifying medication regimens um, and then sort of clearly kindness and empathy go a long way. Um, and then a, a cool, um, a cool thing that was included in the study is that some patients were discharged to medical respite programs, um, similar to respite at Harborview, where there was like a nurse on site and they had help with med titration and safe places to keep their meds. Um, and uh, the patient experiences in, in those settings were um, like much more positive and people had much better uh, sort of self-management skills. Um, I think that's that would be a helpful model to try to try to reproduce um, because that like first month after uh, diagnosis with heart failure is so important for med titration and, um, and diuretic management. Um, so then sort of going back through those four, uh, four um, pieces of discharge education. So what is heart failure? This is the same slide because I, I really don't think you need to change um, how you define the disease process um, for a patient who is homeless. Um, discharge teaching for meds, I, I think, um, I think, uh, I've, yeah, I think sort of the takeaway here is that uh, we should ask our patients more about what their day-to-day -day life looks like outside the hospital and how medications fit into that. And from that gauge, whether they would rather be on daily or twice daily meds. Um, because even if the gold standard is to have people on Entresto, um, you can pretty easily substitute an ACE or an ARB for the Entresto and then just dose the beta blocker daily. Um, and your, your more complex um, BID meds are now uh, just in the morning. And this can be helpful if um, you know patients are out and about during the day. Um, and don't wanna take their meds with them because they might uh, misplace them or have them stolen. Um, uh, or if they have, um, yeah, it just may, makes it a little easier uh, if meds are dosed daily. And then for self-care, um, the ways I would modify this, um, for salt restriction, I, I personally think it's a little inhumane to um, ask someone who is, has unstable access to housing and likely has um, significant food instability to restrict what they eat. Um, so I, I, I recommend not including salt restriction and sodium restriction in your discharge teaching. I would, I would ask about access to food because that will affect um, response to diuretics. Um, and I, I think including education around like, well, if you do eat more salt, you might need more diuretics is appropriate. Um, but that's how I would modify that. Um, for weight, I think 
first asking if the patient has access to a scale. And if they don't, the easiest thing to do is um, instead of uh, having your return precautions be weight-based, like if you gain two pounds in a day or five in a week to uh, call, have them be symptom-based. So just take whatever symptom the patient came in with, whether it's edema or shortness of breath, um, and uh, say, sort of give them a scale like, well, if when you came into the ER, your, your edema was a 10. When it gets to a seven out of 10, um, give a call to the clinic um, and, um, and sort of explain what's going on. Again, no fluid restriction. And then to James's point earlier for diuretics, um, it really important to really to sort of be transparent that the frequent urination will continue outside of the hospital. It might be a little less intense than when they were, they are on um, IV diuretics in the hospital, but um, uh, important to be open about that and, and then ask if, when they will have access to restrooms and try to time the diuresis around that. Um, and then think through well, like uh, possible places, like public places to, to use the restroom. The library is always a good one. Um, I would bet Harborview um, would be uh, maybe not with COVID restrictions, but um, usually the lobby bathrooms in, in Harborview are open and, and available. And then I have written, on two occasions, I've written doctor's notes, um, sort of vaguely stating that it's medically necessary for my patient to take a medication that makes them urinate a lot. And that um, while well, that's not what I recommend that they do, that if they are, if they do urinate in public, um, that uh, uh, SPD should be lenient in their citation. I, I don't know if that has any effect. Um, yeah, if I, I meant to contact SPD to ask them what they thought about that, but I didn't didn't have the time this week. But I'll um, I'll get back to you all. Um, and then return precautions. Um, just a quick plug for the Harborview Pards Clinic. Um, they they're like a great example of really um, all the providers are very patient centered and. Um, uh, they have like an open door policy. Um, so if, if patients miss appointments or get their, lose their meds, they can come back in any time and, and get refills. Um, and so I think if you're at Harborview and the patient isn't on a CARDS primary service, it is worthwhile to either like call the consult team um, or call the CARDS clinic and say, hey, we have a patient with new heart failure. We'd like them to follow up in clinic um, and get them a follow-up appointment. And a lot of the times the, um, the clinic nurses will come into the hospital and, and meet the patients and physically show them where the clinic is, um, which I think can help even just knowing where in the building the clinic is can really help um, uh, improve uh, follow-up um, because Harborview can be a little bit of a maze. <clears throat> and then again, return precautions can be symptom-based and the same ER uh, return precautions. Cool, and I think I'm running a little short on time, but the last, um, just so you have something, um, I know I covered a lot, and um, so you have something to take away from this. Um, I did, I created three smart phrases in Epic. Um, they should be live now, um, and you might have to do, I'm really bad at Epic, but you might have to do that thing where like, they're currently my smart phrase, so you just kind of like add yourself to it. Um, but if you type in CBK, my initials, HFDC, that will bring up a smart phrase for heart failure discharge recommendations. Um, and there's some personalization you'll have to do, like what meds people are on and what doses, but it, it includes most of what we talked about today. Um, the second smart phrase is uh, CBK HFDC2, and this, um, is adapted for a, a patient who's homeless. It, it, it uh, requires a little more personalization based on um, based on the patient's um, uh, meds and, and needs. And then lastly, um, uh, uh, CDK public urine is a smart phrase for a um, sort of generic public urination letter. Um, that you can send your patient out with um, when you're discharging them on a ton of diuretics uh, and nowhere to pee. Um, so to wrap up, um, what, I, what I want everyone to take home from this talk, 
heart failure and homelessness equals worse outcomes. Um, discharge education is where we as residents and future attendings can make a difference in ways we can do that. We can simplify medications. Um, we can use symptom-based return precautions if patients don't have access to a scale. And always remember that empathy and kindness go a long way. And the ultimate goal um, is to meet patients where they are and, um, and um, help them feel welcome in the healthcare environment so that they'll, they'll come back when they need help. Um, cool, um, happy to take any questions now or via email later on. And yeah, thanks everyone for listening and participating. Cooper, thanks, this was great. There's just a couple of questions. Um, one is, would you mind just showing the, the smart phrases again? Maybe while we're just wrapping up the question. Oh, Rashid is helping us out too. Oh, thanks Rashid. Yeah, um, I can type them into the chat or actually Rashid is doing that much more quickly than I am. Um, there was another question earlier that was from Paul. I feel like this is a long shot, but is there any data comparing once daily ACE versus once daily ARNI for people who struggle to take BID meds? Oh yeah, I thought of, I, um, I don't think so just because, yeah, like the pharmacokinetics of Dalsartan uh, mean that it's always dosed BID. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I don't really know. I don't think it's been studied. I don't really know what, my guess is that you would just lose some, there'd be like a 12-ish hour period where you're, the patient's, you know, steady state or serum levels of, uh, of Entresto were too low and they weren't getting uh, RAS inhibition um, and all the nephrolysin inhibition. Um, but I don't know, that's a good question. Like whether uh, sort of suboptimal dosing of Entrasto is better than ACE or ARB. I don't know. Um, and then just one comment from Joe that I feel like might be helpful for us. I've heard from patients staying at some shelters that they will not allow urinal bottles at the bedside unless the patient has a physician note. Oh, that is a great uh, tip that maybe, yeah, that, the note should be um, maybe less, like regardless of whether the um, like police uh, acknowledge them or are helpful just for, um, yeah, being in a shelter and, and having access to urinal. Thanks, Joe. All right. Well, thanks so much again, Cooper. Cool. This is a great framework for us. Um, why don't